everyone and welcome to this Nelson Mandela Foundation webinar entitled Beyond Liberty, a New Social Contract. My name is Judith February. I'm a trustee of the Nelson Mandela Foundation and I will be facilitating uh, this panel this afternoon. I'd like to welcome our panelists uh, this afternoon, a very interesting and erudite panel. Um, Dr. Michael Jordan is a venture capitalist and he's the former CEO of First National Bank. Michael now heads up a private investment company, Montegray Capital, and he has a strategic role in 21 startups, which range from um, the data-driven mobile network RAIN to um, the algorithmic investment fund NMRQL. And then Musa Gribani. Musa is an activist and she's worked in advocacy um, and organizing, particularly in informal settlements on issues of land and basic service delivery and also policing. She's recently joined the Open Society Foundation, where she's looking at ways to in which philanthropy can assist um, activists in making an impact on society. And then last but not least, um, Professor Leonard Prague. Leonard um, is a philosopher and he has uh, published widely, um, particularly on issues of African political philosophy and Ubuntu. And for the past nine years, he's also been the editor of the UKZN scholarly imprint, Thinking Africa. He's taught at UWC, Fort Hare, and the University of Pretoria. So we'd like to welcome all of you um, who, are, who are listening in, watching, um, and also to, to the panelists. At first, this webinar is the precursor to the annual Nelson Mandela Foundation lecture, which is going to be delivered on the 18th of July, as always, but this time it's going to be done virtually. We're very pleased this year to be able to welcome the United Nations Secretary General Antonio uh, Guterres to address us and his, the title of his lecture will be Tackling the Inequality Pandemic, a New Social Contract for a New Era. And I think that given where the world is, given that we are facing um, what it's, what's now become, try to say, unprecedented times, we look forward to the head of a multilateral agency uh, addressing us on larger global questions. And lastly, I'd like to thank we, the Nelson Mandela Foundation. We'd like to thank the Hans Seidel Foundation, who are the funders uh, for this event. So today's topic um, is Beyond Liberty, a New Social Contract. And in 1994, South Africans gained political freedom and those civil and political rights and socioeconomic rights really were a very crucial starting point to building a more just and equitable society. But we know that these deep, deep injustices remain, poverty, inequality, unemployment, which are tearing apart our social fabric. And our historical grievances, which are economic, but also the grievance of the past, our fractured past, they've all not been dealt with. And so here we sit as we gather in the midst of a global pandemic. And what we can see is that the fragility of our institutions and the fragility of our social contract is being laid bare. And I think many are questioning whether individual rights, whether democracy is meaningless when the vast majority of South Africans exercise these rights in the midst of a sea of want and inequality. The constitution, which is our founding document, really our very own social contract, is deeply threatened by this economic hardship and inequality that most South Africans face. And added to this, we also know that race and class intersect in the most precarious of ways in our country. And sometimes it feels as if we haven't, we know we haven't done enough to give life to our founding document. And globally, we've seen that uh, different ways of, of governance, um, which are springing up around us, new strains of authoritarianism and populism, new ways of managing economies like we've seen in China and of managing the health crisis. And so today we want to look at how to form a new social contract in South Africa, because we sure do need one. And so, how do you do that in light of a state which is broken, which is dysfunctional, and which is often violent? And it seems as if we have a narrative of redress and forgiveness and reconciliation in South Africa, but it's yet to find true form apart from uh, beyond this sort of transient nature of sporting events. And so that's a, a backdrop uh, to the discussion. And 
I think I want to, to bring you in now, Michael, um, to it's just to look at the economy. I mean, President Ramaphosa, when he talked about, when he was addressing us in one of the many addresses on, on coronavirus, he talked about building an inclusive economy. He talked about building uh, linkages between, um, between the state um, and, and also between, um, between civil society, business, labor, community and government to restructure the economy and achieve inclusive growth. He's also said difficult days and difficult decisions lie ahead. How do we build that compact where it often seems as if those sectoral approaches, that silo-based approach to the social contract is really not working and it's not good enough? And how do we move from a, the binaries of kind of command economy versus unfettered capitalism? Where is that sweet spot in the middle which allows for this inclusive growth? True, those are big questions. Um, let me see how I do. I, I'd say the first one is saying that has now been attributed to quite a number of people, but it's so apt and it says, don't waste a good crisis. Um, and right now we have a crisis. It's very difficult to doubt that. Um, apart from the epidemic itself, we have economic crisis, we have a crisis where jobs are being lost. In an economy, as you pointed out earlier, that already has a whole lot of question marks around it. We have not grown properly, we haven't created jobs, and we haven't redivided the spoils that they are uh, appropriately. And sometimes when there's a crisis like this, the ideas that you then start reaching out to are the ones that have been lying around, that have been fertile, you know, for some time, but you just, you know, didn't have that bias for action to implement them all. So, yes, I think this is a great topic. I also think it's a great time to actually take out, shall we say, all the ideological discussions and focus on the facts and the science and to make the type of decisions to create the country that we all have and that we want to create for our children. So, um, I'd, I'd make a, a, a second call here, and that is that we, we can't be too ideological about it. I think that's one of the things that's holding us back. Whatever our views are, can we go back to science and facts and, and see what the rest of the world has done um, to make it better? So, for argument's sake, there are things that are actually the science of economic growth. You know, forget the ideology, there's certain things that you can do, and you know that if you take those decisions, growth will happen. And at the same time, there's also a science for risk redistribution, doing it in such a way that there's a social compact that, um, that, it, that it actually works. So I'd, I'd, I'd go back to facts. Um, a second point I'd like to make, um, and this comes now from my background as a venture capitalist or somebody who backs startups, um, we don't always need to have huge macro plans to solve everything. I love startups because they are small little examples of doing something correct. And if it's correct, um, it can grow to become something big. So I would plead many cases for pilots. Don't come up with a grand plan to, let's say, fix education in the country. Why don't we fix it in one classroom first and prove that it works? And if it works in that classroom, maybe we can do it to the whole grade, and if it works in the grade, to the school, and in the school, to other schools, etc. Far too often, I think, we have these debates about, let's say, fixing the entire um, health system in the country without first proving in a small way that, that, that we can make it work. Um, I, I, I've got a lot more to say, many more examples, but I, I don't want to monopolize it too much. I just want to make one final point. We can debate the role of business versus labor, versus government, versus a whole lot of other entities. Um, but the biggest danger we have in South Africa is that there's so much crime and corruption that even if we get those things sorted out optimally, we could still not make progress. So if you have a society that is ridden with crime and corruption, it doesn't matter if you choose a communist model or a socialist model or a capitalist model, it's just not going to work if you don't observe, respect, and implement the basic rules of law. So I'm, I'm just making the point as a, that as a foundation for us to move forward, um, we really have to see that people who have done wrong um, actually end up being punished for it. We need to see some famous people maybe in jail. Um, justice uh, to happen must be seen to be happening. And for me, that is like a basic precondition um, long before we start debating whether the state is better or labor is better or whoever is better to solve a certain problem. Let's just get governance in our society correct 
and let's get criminals in jail. And I think that will already help us um, on the path forward. Thanks, Michael. I want to bring um, Leonard in here because, I, I mean, I, I understand all of what you're saying and around issues of the rule of law. And I just want to, to push a bit on, on the social compact and, and maybe Leonard and Musa also feel free to come in. So this idea, it feels to me as if this sectoral approach which we have, uh, the sectoral approach which we have, government, business, labor, community, um, labor, that, you know, everything's got to happen in Ned Lack and then things collapse and well, then things collapse. And so uh, for me, I, it seems as if we need what Darlene Miller and Erin McCandless call a kind of the, the resilience of a new social compact. But, but how do you do that? Because, you know, how? I think we, we need to get into these traditional dialogues haven't worked. So, um, Michael, while you, I mean, I don't know if you want to take a stab, but I also, Leonard, I want to, to bring you in on that, particularly given your um, work on uh, issues of Ubuntu, because if, you, if I look at um, a kind of working definition of social cohesion, which underlies any proper social contract, it's the extent to which people are cooperative within and across boundaries without coercion or purely self-interested motivation. So how do you get people out of their silos without coercion? Um, so Leonard and then Michael, I'll get back to you. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Judith. Can you hear me? Um, I'm going to, um, thanks for throwing that question at me. I'm going to deal with it in a way that philosophers typically do. And this is by a sort of conceptual Another interrogation. Question. As, yeah, interrogate the question to see how the framing of the question already puts us in a corner in a sense. And to once we unpack the concepts used in the question, we'll see how certain answers are almost predetermined by the way we frame the question. And um, the, 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 the bit of the question that I want to um, focus on here to loosen up the conversation in the direction of an answer is the notion of a social contract. Um, now, as a philosophical concept in theory, um, the idea of a social contract has an extensive history in Western philosophy of about two and a half thousand years. Um, has gone through very modulations and mutations, but certainly the most influential of them are always based on the same assumption. And that assumption is that the individual is conceptually prior to the social. Okay, which is just another way to say that we born and we function as self-interested driven individuals who are driven by the need to protect and advance our self-interest enter into a social contract. So here's already something problematic at work in the very question we are addressing. Can we shift the paradigm towards the so-called new world if we still employ the language of a social contract that is based on such a problematic assumption? Right, so here's the, th here's the first loosening up. Um, now, that question is not unrelated to the second theme that you, um, that you wanted to address um, in this invitation, namely um, what to do with state violence in the light of Black Lives Matter and so on. So it's, um, those two questions are conceptually connected through the notion of the social contract because um, the modern state as we know it, and I don't need to tell you this, but is founded on the notion of a social contract. Okay, um, we famously live our self-interested driven lives until we realize it doesn't work. And then we enter into a contract whereby we all agree to sacrifice certain of our rights for a guarantee of the remainder. And the most fundamental natural right we sacrifice is the right to violence. If you hurt me, I get to hurt you. So we all sacrifice that right handed over to the state, which then has a monopoly on the exercise of violence. But it's still the logic of the social contract at work. So the second question posed here in terms of Black Lives Matter is, um, I don't think it's the question, how do we imagine a, a state without violence or a non-violent state? Because if you follow the logic, the social contract logic of how the state is created, the state has a monopoly on violence. And I think it will be very difficult to imagine a state without a monopoly on violence. The question is rather, how do we conceive of the limitations of the state's exercise of, the, of, of violence so that the state becomes an, a responsible custodian of violence 
um, and interestingly enough, um, this is something we've seen in American, some American states and cities over the last couple of weeks, where there's a contestation over exactly this. Is it, should we talk about the state force, or the police force, or the police service? Now that's a fundamental shift, because force goes to often unlimited, unfettered exercise of the right to violence. Whereas if you reconceive the police as a service, well, that's another logic altogether. Um, so I just wanted to loosen up this notion. I don't think we're going to shift the paradigm as we need to if we keep talking about social contract. We need to reconceive. I, I, I heard both you and Michael use the word compact, which is a slightly different shift. Um, but I think we need to at first loosen up that concept and go, we're not going, we're not going to get to where you want me to go. And that is how do we incorporate communitarian values such as Ubuntu into the liberal democratic frame, as long as we're trying to squeeze it into a social contract, because they're based on two fundamentally different assumptions. The contract well, is based on in individualism, Ubuntu is based on the exact inverse assumption is that the social creatures first, and whatever rights you can exercise must be exercised within the communal or the relationality of our, of our existence. Well, this is very interesting because, I mean, I, you know, the political speak and the political language, which I suppose I'm repeating and which the invite and, and Michael, we, which we repeat and which the president repeats is, is this idea of a social contract, social compact, and those words are used interchangeably. But I mean, Leonard, your position is interesting because, I mean, you, you challenge us to, to think about the way we construct language um, and and how we so that we can get to get to the answers. So if you were to if you were to deconstruct it, so if you if we were to to think outside the box of that language, how do we take how do we take the notion of Ubuntu then and um, deal with it in the light of our constitution? I suppose um, you know which the lawyer in me and is our founding document and is is a form of a social contract i think that there you know there wasn't enough buying and so on but but how do we it is there and how do we do, how do we use the ubuntu how do we get that inside what is a, a sort of box in a sense what kind of framework uh, perhaps that's a better way of dealing with it yeah, and, and, and here I would um, <laughs> like to um, go back to um, Michael's bumper sticker of don't waste a good crisis. Um, we've gone through this in South Africa. The transition from, from apartheid to democracy was a political experiment that called for new thinking. And I think there's much to be learned about the much maligned um, TRC experiment. Very problematic in very senses. Um, I grant, I grant that. But what is fascinating about the first bench of constitutional court judges and the first couple of concord judgments that came out um, in the first 10 years or so is that there was some recognition of the fact that liberal democracy in itself is not enough. The regime of individual rights is not enough. In order to interpret them, make sense of them, and I hate using the word, but Africanize this project, is we need to draw on extra juridical values such as communitarianism or Ubuntu, in order to interpret the law. Yeah. That's interesting because, I mean, Len yeah, sorry, continue, because yeah. Mahoro has actually used that in one of her constitutional court judgments. But yeah. continue, yeah. and then I'll bring Musa in. Um, so where I was headed with my argument is, if you look at some of what are called now the, the foundational court judgments, and uh, probably the most um, um, the clearest example here was um, Justice uh, Mohammed's um, ruling in Azapu and others versus President of the Republic in 96, the contestation over Biko, you know, the challenging of the constitutionality of the TRC as such. And to this day, I think it is, um, well, it's a much contested judgment, but there was, we got a glimmer of what it meant to deal with political conundrum of individual rights versus communitarian values, because that judgment in, in essence said, yes, you have the, the right, you have the political right for due process and so on, but right now we need to forge social cohesion, we need to forge a society that in future will, ex but that will exist so that it in future can invoke its rights. So there's something foundational in our constitutional regime that I think gets neglected. Um, mm -hmm. Um, there was an ambition, there was an experiment mm. of how to do this differently, 
that has fallen a little bit by the wayside. I, I would say if you want to grapple with the Constitution at this moment, go back to the founding of the Constitution because the, found, the Constitution was ironically founded on the suspension of the Constitution mm. in the name of the common good or social cohesion. Yeah, fascinating, um, Leonard. Musa, I'd like to bring you in because, I mean, your work in Kyle Eacher and, you know, last week and, and just talking about this notion of Ubuntu and, and Leonard, I mean, this, this is fascinating. You know, let's go back to the beginning because in a sense, you know, we keep sort of building on poor foundations and let's kind of, you know, do we have to start um, redigging the hole in a sense? But, you know, time is of the essence. So that kind of thing is, um, it takes time. But Musa, I want to come to you because how does this translate? Um, I mean, what Leonard's talking about, how does that translate in a place like Kailich, in communities where you have this, um, often frameworks like the IDP and all of that, where people seem removed from those technocratic processes. And it feels as if the people are very far away from the decisions that affect their everyday lives. Um, and, and also th then the interaction with the state becomes uh, mired often in violence. And so it's, it's, it's interesting. And, and I must thank Leonard for his, so Leonard taught me at university when I was at Rawls. <laughs> So this is, is, is quite an interesting reunion. <laughs> this is not good. <laughs> We're going to be outnumbered um, by philosophers. Yeah. And, and so um, what, what is important about, uh, about what Leonard says, and, and I suppose th this idea of, of a social contract built on liberalism and the idea that people are not a community, but a collection of individuals and all of us are out for each other for one another. So this idea that we are atomized um, in our existences and that we don't we don't exist in, in, in community and how that plays itself out in various ways and how it plays itself out um, in, in how A, we understand what is meant by rights and that there is a global culture, I think, that has been exposed by COVID particularly in that we see our rights as operating in isolation of the rights of others. And so I don't want to wear a mask, so I'm going to go in a protest about not wearing masks. And I don't believe that I should not be able to wear to walk my dog. And despite what that means and the implications of that is for society, we have come to understand our rights to work only for us. And that is the antithesis of rights. Rights are meant to allow us to work together. And, and these are the failings of our social contract, which are then built on liberalism and the individual as being first and the community second. Um, and I think in South Africa, at least, our radical tradition tries to debunk that and to infuse us into community. Um, and, and, and when, uh, so Leonard's point really around violence and state violence and that when we give up our liberties, and that the state has this monopoly on violence which is true and which is what we saw in Kailicha. But also in the manner in which the state dispenses its violence is also very interesting because what we saw, particularly with Bulelani last week, speaks to greater failings of the state and that the state fails to provide housing. And, and we can have a long discussion about the various ways in which the state has failed people in its provision of housing. And then criminalizes people and subjects them to violence when people then find alternatives for places to live. And this situation is untenable. So the rights that we give up for the state to be able to dispense violence in the hopes that, that the state will do so in an effort to keep us safe, we then become targets of that violence. And, and there is an excessive criminalization in South Africa, particularly where I live in, in Cape Town, where poverty has been made a, a criminal thing to exist as a poor person in the city, where the lawmakers, the municipal lawmakers, have created bylaws called nuisance bylaws which criminalize things like spitting in a public place and sitting in a public space and falling asleep in this public space. And the state then dispenses its violence against us for merely existing as people who are impoverished or just because those laws, that woman who was sitting on a bench waiting for an interview in Camps Bay, who was then arrested, an ordinary person is never arrested for sitting on a bench. 
So the kinds of people who these laws work against work directly towards impoverished people. But I suppose I must disagree with Leonid, is that it is not difficult to imagine a world without state violence. And in fact, there are very many iterations in society where people live with minimal policing. And so, the, I, so there is a date where policing starts. So, so, so policing has a history and it starts at a particular point in history. And it, it's not, it's not in, woven into the fiber of who we are. We can live lives without the state surveillancing us. Because the function of police, if it is to keep us safe, it does not do that. The state machinery that landed on Collins Causes home, for example, which was the JMPD, the SANDF, together with SAPS, the entire security forces of the state that landed on this man's home, which later resulted in his death, did not make him feel safe. And we begin to see, particularly in the Black Lives Matter movement, that the presence of policing does not result in safer communities. So then why have we lent this power to the state to dispense with violence if it does not result in our collective safety? And perhaps our language could not be abolitionism as to borrow it from, from the Black Lives Movement, but perhaps we need a lexicon. And perhaps we need to find ways in which we as communities, when we start seeing ourselves as individuals moving around, but us as communities to figure out what is the best way for us to be safe. And, and can we, when we revert to this idea that in actual fact, our rights are group rights. They're individually preferred, but they belong to the community. Mm -hmm. So uh, thanks Musa and, and Leonard for that intervention, which really is kind of, as you said, Leonard, opening up the question. And it almost takes us back to kind of the beginning and back to basics in a sense. And, um, and again, that requires the reflection and the time. And for me, it seems as if Michael's words, you know, the words don't waste a good crisis. And here we are in COVID-19. So if, and I've heard Michael talking about the rule of law, about corruption, and um, somebody's put something on the chat talking about the constitution and the NDP and the Farland Commission contemplating a police service and the need to demilitarize the police. Here, here we are um, still stuck with this police force in a sense. But if we had, how do we, um, if tomorrow we woke up and we could say, right, how do we start this process of, of, um, of this inclusive society, of this society where we are um, cognizant of, of the group and cognizant of the, of the collective? And I mean, Leonard, some might argue that, um, you know, the constitution tries to do that with socioeconomic rights um, and so on as well. But, um, so, so I'd like to, to just think practically about what this looks like if you are Cyril Ramaphosa and you are heading up the broken state, the broken economy and the dysfunctional cabinet. Michael. So maybe let's invert this a little bit here. Do we have a social contract in the country? Or if we have one, is it a danger of breaking down right now? Um, I'm kind of unfortunately in the negative category. I, I don't, we can say we have a constitution and things are written down, but if you look at the reality of the lives of most South Africans, I, I think it's a sad state of affairs, unfortunately. And if you ask me that, how, if, there is, if there are maybe remnants of a social contract, what would risk it breaking down completely? I, I, would, I would argue maybe the biggest thing is that 30% of adults who want a job don't have a job which robs them of dignity, not, not just of income. Um, the fact that we have poverty as a result of that, very difficult to have a social contract when you have a large society, a portion of society in poverty uh, and uh, amidst wealth. I'd, I'd say the fact that we have a failing education system um, that produces some of the worst results in the world. And because we have that failing education system, you um, don't have equal access to opportunity. Um, which is, has to be one of the tenets. And because you don't have equal access to opportunity, you're not going to have equal outcomes. And if you have unequal outcomes, it's not just income, it's in wealth. So at a very basic level for me, it starts with education, 
um, which, you know, you don't want to have enough uh, people that are educated appropriately and you have an economy that isn't growing enough, you know. So, so it's as basic as that. I think, of course, there are very many higher order things that we can debate in terms of a social contract and it would be lovely if we can get there one day. Mm. But for me, if you ask me if I'm Cyril Ramaphosa, I think we urgently need to get this economy to grow. We need to get it to grow in an employment intensive way so that people have jobs and have dignity and have income. How and, do we do that, Michael? And How I'll, do we do I'll that? Get, I'll get, and and once, once we get that going, then we have to be deliberate about redistributing it in such a way that people can agree, that wealthy people in the country can say, I agree that I should pay those taxes because I want to live in a country where we don't have these large type of disparities. So how do we grow? Really, this is not a, a pseudoscience. It's not magic. You can go and look at countries that have grown and you can see what have they done that we haven't done. And there's some basic things like respect for property rights, rewarding incentives uh, for the right type of people, allowing a certain amount of innovation, creativity. Um, I think the thing that we really miss in this country is confidence. It is the cheapest stimulant that, that, that that could be given back into the country. We have all the capabilities, we have some great people. We, we could actually be growing very fast if there were greater confidence. Now, how you do that? I think it has a lot to do with leadership. Um, and I'm actually far less critical of our leadership. I think there are examples in the world where leaders actively um, operate in a us versus them kind of scenario. I'm in power now, we better versus a we type of scenario. Um, but I, but I think we need, and this is now the business person in me coming out, you just need to set very clear targets. We want to grow at a certain percentage. I believe this economy can grow at 5%. What are the things, what are the hard decisions? Um, I, I say the very clear decisions one can take, they're all hard. What are the hard decisions one needs to take to get there? Then hold people accountable. Hold your cabinet accountable the way, you know, as a CEO, I would hold my ex-co accountable. Measure people according to that. And it, it is quite incredible that what things can happen. So if we were to say, for example, that we're going to hold every single business in South Africa accountable for, and they're going to be incentives and punishment for creating jobs. If we just did that, instead of a whole lot of other regulation, I think we would be very successful in creating some jobs uh, very fast. So you ask me what I worry about, what I worry about our country and our children. It's the fact that there are so many people out there without jobs and without the dignity. And I think it can be fixed. Hmm. Um, Leonard, I'm going to bring you in there because I, su I suppose if you listen to that as the philosopher in you, um, you would say that that's doing it all the wrong way around in a sense. No, it's not the wrong way around. I think, they, you know, they're, they're, they're complementary angles that we need as many angles on this issue as we can get. And I understand where Michael is coming from and I hear it. It's just not the domain in which I work. You know, I, I listen to say what Musa has just said. My, so our, my question would be, how do we position activism in relation to the political juridical regime? How do we, how, what, is, what is the relationship between activism and the constitution or, you know, as, as, a, as a document? Um, and, and I think there's far, far too little. There have been some, some successes, but perhaps not enough activism um, pointed and aimed at the realization of socioeconomic rights. Now, yeah, I have, I have to, wait, and I actually have a question for you. <laughs> for me? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, let me the, the fascinating thing about our constitution is that it accommodates socioeconomic rights, but, you know, it is promissorily structured. Um, mm. you, in, and, you know, you have the right, but, and here's the weakness of the mechanism, it is up to the state to decide when it has sufficient money for its realisation. Now, if you have a state cap, if you have a state capture situation, you know, in retrospect, you look back and you go, with all that money that was stolen from us, how many of the social economic rights could we have realised in the process? Because this is my this is my response to Michael. How we shift things is to improve the material conditions that people live in, so that they don't end up with a vacuous idea that they have a political right that means nothing because. They, they, they can vote, but they live in squalor. Nothing has essentially changed because we're not really capitalizing on that mechanism of socioeconomic rights embedded in the constitution the way we could. Yeah. Well, so, Leonard, now, I'm going to, yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm going to, yeah, sorry, yes. I have a quick question for you, the lawyer. This is who's at, turning, this is, uh, this is my show, <laughs> Leonard. This is what philosophers do, we turn it around on other people. <laughs> 
<laughs> my, question artists, to you, yeah. my question to you is, given the status of socioeconomic rights in our constitution, are we really a liberal democracy or are we a social democracy? Well, I mean, I just I want to say the, the question about and I'll answer you like a lawyer, the, the questions around socioeconomic rights. I, I think that that was a it's, a it's pretty bold to put that in a constitution. But the question is, it's again, it's progressively realizable because the alternative to that is, you know, you put all these rights in and people don't ac don't can't access them. Um, perhaps in the way that they have now. And so, and I wouldn't um, say, look, I'm not a panelist here, but I wouldn't say, I disagree with you that we haven't used our rights, the socioeconomic rights, um, as uh, the justiciability of those rights as, as much as we could. There's been some pretty groundbreaking litigation that's that has happened so um but we can always do better so musa that's where i'm coming to you um is you know in places like kailicha what how do we take this how do we um you know make rights real well, the, the vacuums that there are around modes of governance how do you you know leonard's question is people feel you know what's the point of having a constitution and rights when actually i'm um bullying Kolani and i'm being dragged out of my shack by um, Cape Town law enforcement. And I think um, that's very important because poverty undermines any rights that you have. Because by being poor, you are stripped of, of rights. And, and the only people who act, can actually exercise rights are generally South Africa white people with money. And, and everyone else must fight for their space and time and dignity. And others are afforded that dignity quite easily. But I must go, and, and, and I mean, to Michael's point, is that corruption will undermine any single effort that the state takes, and it will undermine people's confidence in the state. And, and so increasingly, um, and, and, and South Africans have shown by increasingly not voting, that they are less and less confident, particularly young people. Young people, 60% um, of young people in this country are unemployed. And we saw that when we had to go to vote next year, that white people, that young people did not vote because they are tapping out of the system because the system has failed them. Um, and, and in my work in, in, in Kailicha particularly, I think the, the idea of unemployment is completely debilitating to communities. And it is a sense of hopelessness and it is an abyss that brings about the worst kind of misery. And, and, and one would, and, and the, I, the, South, the South Africa's very little growth in employment, if any, and our failing and ailing economy results in these issues of violence, right? And, and so when we, so these issues that, that we talk about, even of needing police and that we need the police because our society is violent and we've, we believe that if we didn't have the police and we'd all die, the reason why is because people are poor. And so you create conditions where a society is extremely violent. And on the violence indicator, it's not as much poverty, it is inequality. It is having Kailicha and Camps Bay in the same city that creates an untenable condition for people to be able to live in. Because I cannot clean a home of 10 million rand and go live in a shack in Kailicha, and for that to remain, to have a society remain stable. And so what we need to do is that as we create wealth, also think about robust ways of redistribution of wealth. How do we, how do those who have make sure that the rest of us are living in dignity? And, 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 and a great misconception in my work that I found is that people like getting government grants and that people like getting state houses and people like going to quintile wine schools or like the idea of not being able to feed their own children and having to have the state feed them at school. And that is, there is indignity within itself. Most people would like to build their own homes and would like to take children, would like to feed their own children and would like to have the dignity to be able to self-actualize and not be paternalized by the state through grants, through education that is, in, you know, in mad schools and all of that. And the way to do that is to ensure that people are having dignified livelihoods. And in the Western Cape, for example, we fare as the lowest rate of unemployment at 20%, which is still quite high. 
but that is from farm workers who earn a pittance. And so that kind of labor will not result in a transformed society. And so when you pay people 50 rand a day, you're doing nothing to reverse that. You're increasing inequality and increasing violence and violence both in the home and violence against property and people in general. And so if we are self-interested and interested in the security of ourselves, our homes and our bodies, we ought to be interested in people being employed, that being gainful employment and those livelihoods being dignified. And, and I think the issue of employment for me is central to this question, but also the dignity around that. Indeed. Um, I'd just like to invite um, those of you who are listening and watching, um, if you have a question, um, you're welcome to put it in the chat and, um, and I'll read it out. Um, there was a question for you, Michael, from Paul Hoffman, um, who's known to many of you, I'm sure. What percentage of the unemployed in South Africa are actually unemployable due to the lack of appropriate skills, education and trainability? Um, have you any idea? And then um, Sipu Kutle says, we're an oligarchal democracy. Um, Leonard, that one's for you. Michael? No, I, no, Paul, um, I can't give you the exact percentage, but I can give you my, my impression that it is unfortunately very high, um, that we are producing people that don't have the basic skills, basic reading and writing and comprehension and articulation. Um, and the, the sad reality of today is that even that is not adequate. We have a world that is moving fast into a completely different age, a digital age, where the type of skills you need to have isn't history at school or um, uh, religious studies or um, geography, but, but uh, it's complex problem solving, it's entrepreneurial thinking, it's teamwork, etc. So we have a schooling system that is very much predicated on a very old world, the industrial type of world, that's is most certainly not directed to what the market wants. And even though it's not well directed, it is not fulfilling in its basic um, uh, purpose of the more or less a million people which join the schooling system every year. Only about 200,000 ended 12 years later with the most basic criteria to go on to a tertiary level. Um, so it's not, it's just over 20%, it should be 80%. And they should be versed in those skills that the new economy wants. So it, it's an incredibly sad mismatch of affairs that we have in South Africa. And just to give you the other side of that, you know, when I was in big businesses, they, they have made very many vacancies. They have need for skills. If you ask them what one of their biggest problems are, they would say we want skills, but they want Java developers and they want chartered accountants and they want engineers and scientists and so on. So you have this massive, massive mismatch in South Africa. And, and I, I'm, I'm so sorry, I just want to come back to the most basics of basics. If we don't fix that education system, we just won't have the skills to grow the economy. If you can't grow the economy, you can't create the jobs and the employment and the tax, and you can't fix all of these other things. So we have to fix the education system in South Africa. And by the way, that too can be done. There are hundreds of other countries in the world that are getting better results in week than, than we are. And they've taken certain action. One of them, by the way, is merit. Um, you know, if, if principals do well, they get promoted. They don't do well, there's certain actions you can take to, to make them do better. And the same with teachers mm -hmm. and so on. This is not rocket science. There are very serious problems in our society. And we, are, we need to use this crisis to now address them for once and for all. Um, this shouldn't be something that has anything to do with ideology. This should be South Africans that come together and say, education is very, very important. We all realize that. By the way, in surveys that have been done, this is one of those things that all the us together in South Africa, no one would argue that education isn't important. People don't always know exactly which courses are the most important ones to secure in those jobs in the future, but we agree on education. So they would be, you know, there are hundreds of things we must fix in the country, but I wish we could just fix our education system because within one generation, we would be a different country. Absolutely, Ma. Um, I've got a question for you, Musa, from Nisha Vargesi, who are, who, she says, how can we make those who have, who have share their wealth with those who don't, thus making South Africa more equal? I suppose in response to, to what you've said, but Leonard and, and Michael, feel free to also come in. And Musa? I, mean, I, I think, um, thank you for that question, but I think maybe um, Michael had alluded to that tax is, is, is one way of, of redistributing that. 
But um, in the space that I worked in for a great deal of time, the big question that we were asking ourselves is this question of redistribution of property. Um, and that South Africa doesn't have really, uh, so even if you taxed people to the max, right, is that you would still have ownership in the terms of real rights that belong to people who are currently in those homes. And so it doesn't matter how much you tax them, you're not reversing that because you don't have the ability to create more land, for example. Um, and, and so we need to think of ways around, so, so, but also for taxation in order to work, people must have confidence in the state, that the state will then be able to redistribute those resources in an equitable manner. And so even I would volunteer myself to be taxed even further if I truly believe that what is going to happen is, is through those, um, is, is that people would, it would trickle down. Um, and I think that this, the, the manner in which the state operates right now is that even in what are seemingly clear neutral processes, there is corruption embedded within how the, the, the state, in fact, what we inherited was a corrupt apartheid state. And, and, and to a large degree, to continue working in those ways, for example, perpetuates those, those ideas of, those ideas of, of, of that, that were really sown during apartheid. So, so that is just really the, the most basic way one can look at it. But it, it is also this idea of active upliftment of other people and not just, I don't know, lip speak, to, to do very active ways of looking at communities and how do these communities within themselves with their ingenuity which can include formal education but is not limited to formal education and people who've missed that boat cannot be left out um, and, and there are ways to integrate everyone into, into the social fiber of society um, and, and through, for example yeah. Yeah. Please, no, please continue. But, sorry, Musa, um, but I, I mean, it just brings us back to this idea because I think the question about redistribution is about bringing us back to some form of, um, for want of a better phrase, the social solidarity that we're all in it together. You know, we sink or swim together. So how do we, how do we um, go? from beyond the individual to something which is corporate to say, right. And I suppose, and what I'm also hearing is this, the lack of trust in government because of a decade of state capture. And so there's not the trust. And so even here we are not wasting, don't waste a good crisis, but at the same time, people are pretty skeptical of the role of the state um, to, to do anything. Um, and, and that I think seems to sort of drag us back. Leonard, um, do you have comments on what you've heard, um, particularly on this idea of social solidarity? You're going to put your philosopher's mind to it. <laughs> no, not really. I, I can't gonna... answer the question. <laughs> um, I just want to go back to somebody, um, Sipo Kutle, who suggested oh, yes. the question that we um, social democracy. The, the oligar oligarchical, oligarchical democracy. Michael would, Michael would say it's a higher order question. We need to move on. <laughs> It's only because I don't understand it. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, um, I think one, one must be a little bit careful here with um, this distinction between a, an emotive response and a conceptually responsible response. You know, there is a sense in which we, we feel like we're being ruled by, by a small elite whose sole purpose in life seems to be to lie in their own pockets. Um, but I would hesitate to use the phrase to take it too seriously, um, as long as you have a system of government where the separation of powers more or less do what they're supposed to do. And I think, you know, one thing about our judiciary is it's phenomenal integrity, um, you know, to function as exactly a, a check, the kind of check and balances conceived in separation of powers. So I would say, yes, emotively, I can see where you're coming from when you want to call it that, but conceptually, I think we need to be a little bit more careful. Because one day if we end up in a position where the separation of powers has completely been eroded and we are mm. truly being run by a dictator, we will have run out of words to describe that situation because we already used the word oligarchy 20 years ago. Exactly. It's almost like um, the word fascism is sort of bandied yeah. about quite liberally these days, and I think yeah. that's unhelpful. Um, Daniela Berger says, she, in a nutshell, the core issue here is capable governance, people truly representing the citizens by adding value, um, and all, um, yeah, she talks about individual um, 
value to form community and rights have obligations and shouldn't infringe on others. But Musa, I want to bring you in there because I mean, certainly working within communities and I, and also when I think about lockdown, you know, and you think about Collins Corsa, you think about all these, t these, you know, people who've been a, a kind of brutalized and it's not new in South Africa, but certainly lockdown has cast a big light on it. You know, how do we, how do we move beyond that? I mean, I saw that press conference come, I don't know what it was in Kailicha on the weekend with Becky Taylor going to Kailicha to, to speak to um, Mr. Kolani and so on. And there was something interesting about that for me, which is about the spectacle of, of it, and, but also that there's some democracy at work there about people kind of questioning and, and speaking to somebody in power. There's a vacuum there, and how do we fill it? Because but the vacuum can't just be filled by having a minister come over and um, say it's all going to be all right. And the activism, I don't want us to lose sight of Leonard's point about the activism. You know, how do we re rekindle the activism to hold government to account? Uh, I've been working in that activism, so maybe I'll be a little bit defensive and say it exists. No, no, I, I am, I, I'm completely, I am very familiar with what exists. So, um, yeah, but you're welcome to school Leonard there. <laughs> <laughs> but outside of maybe just like the work that um, other people are, are doing it or people like me I think um, I think people feel alienated from the state and I think the primary alienation that people are feeling is from local government um, and Leonard is, a, is in a very precarious position there with with the Makanda municipality um, and that the collapse of local government particularly should be something that's worrying us because those are the first interactions people have with the state and so when I studied in Grahamstown and to hear that there's still no water in Grahamstown, 10 years after I was a student there, um, is, is worrisome. And that, and, and, and that people don't necessarily, I mean, Begitel is nice, but what people need is an effective ward councillor and an effective mayor and an effective um, sub council, because those are the machinery of the state that they interact with on a daily basis. And not, not once have ward councillors' homes been burned down in Kailicha um, and, and, and elsewhere, precisely for this reason that there's alienation, that A, number one, no one really understands what a ward council's job is, no one understands where their power starts or end, um, and there's this perception that these people are earning salaries, but they're not being effective. And, and, and when I need to use a clinic, for example, for my primary health care, that is, that my municipality must deliver to me. And so al although police are, and, and so Pagitale is interesting and nice and he can walk you door to door, but what I really need is my governance to work for me on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think the figures that we released last week on irregular expenditure in municipalities should shock us all to the core. That in fact, the most basic level of government is unable to do its work. And what are the questions there? Because when, when, when communities protest and they burn tires, it's hardly ever against national government. It's because of the local level of government that's ineffective. And so even this idea of like violent protests is born out of this frustration of a government that continues to not hear. And so when Betty Tell is in the directive, he will still have to go to his provincial head, who will still have to go to his local Kailicha head. And so those things, it has to work at those levels in order for it to work. We can mm. all have confidence in Sora Maposa, but I need to have confidence in my ward councillor. Mm. So, I mean, somebody had asked a question about political parties, and as the kind of colonel, it strikes me that, you know, we have a political party problem, mostly an ANC problem, because it governs mostly, um, and, and how, do you stop, how do you stop that rot? But um, I, I don't know, um, Leonard, if you, if you want to come in, and Michael on um, one, because we're sort of having to almost wrap up. So um, if you have final thoughts on just the state, we're heading into local government elections next year, and yeah, it's, it seems uh, precarious for many reasons. Leonard, do you have do you have a comment on that? Yeah, I'll just I'll just hook up with what Musa said. You know, with Mukanda or what used to be Grahamstown in her days, it really, really is precarious. Um, mm -hmm. And I think quick fixes like saying raise taxes, you know, take more money from the rich and give to the poor, it's the kind of quick fix that's not going to work. Because right now I can tell you that I don't feel like I'm getting a bang for my buck. Mm 
half the day I have no water, every second day we don't have electricity, the roads are so poor you can literally not drive in it. Um, and if somebody were to say to me, I have to you know, pay more tax to fix this problem, I'm going to go, really? <laughs> you know, is that the solution? I don't think that's the solution. What intrigues me is, 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 is that um, there was this victory that the unemployment people's movement scored against um, Makanda mm, municipality a while ago, mm -hmm. you know, to declare them basically incompetent. So the town is under administration again mm -hmm. and whatnot. And so there was a brief moment where um, various group of activists and individuals worked together to bring about a real change. Um, but my sense is that, you know, the, because of our history, class, race, divides are so deep that we can't sustain that momentum. You know, we get together well, once, yeah. the municipality bring about a change, score a victory, and the next day that coalition or, you know, send, say their social cohesion for you and the social yeah. contract yeah. as opposed to the contract, individuals yeah. acting together as a community. Why can't we sustain those kind of momentums? Mm. I don't know. Well, I think that's a very important question and possibly for, for another dialogue. Um, we've, we've got a few minutes left and I just, I wanted to wrap it up maybe, uh, Michael, to you for final questions. Just around, so Antonio um, Guterres is going to be talking about, um, you know, tackling this inequality pandemic, but also looking at, um, at inequality and building a sustainable society. And I, I think the focus is also, there's a focus on climate um, and climate change um, for resilient societies. I mean, any last thoughts um, on that perhaps and how it can, um, can um, bring about um, economic growth? So, so if I could make the final remark, I think one of the sad things about the way that, that we run the country is that much of it is in fact to do with a bad history of race, of the class divide, um, and that people get elected based on ideology and on slogans and effectively by branding, you know, it's quite an emotional thing, as it is in many other places in the world where people draw their X. And the world, of course, that I would advocate would be a very different one where uh, people are held accountable for results. Um, you know, where, where it's not an emotional thing, but you say, look, there's potholes in my streets or my, I don't have water here or my houses have not been built or the school is falling apart. And it's, it's a simple thing if we, if we, if we, if the people could influence merit. Um, if we have a simple change in merit, we are a wealthy enough country to fix all the problems. We have the skills in the country. We have the, by far the majority of people who are good people who go to work and want to do well. I actually believe that of government uh, civil servants, I believe that of most people who go to business to work, I believe that of, of all, all labor, we, we want to do good. But the overall system is not set up to reward merit and not set up to, to have accountability. And you know, ultimately, you can't blame the people on the top. You have to blame us, the people, the voters, that, that we are not holding people accountable for the right things. And we are falling trapped for the wrong things, which is ideology and branding. Um, a final closing comment from you, Musa. You've got sort of 30 seconds or so. Sorry, I was on mute. And, and, and I think maybe on, on, your, on your ideas of climate change is that we, we have to really think about that too um, in a very real way going forward. And it is no longer a scientific debate headed by white bearded white men because we've begun to feel the effects of drought and what that means for food security. We began to experience refugee immigration in South Africa. And so this idea of climate change and together, I mean, with ESCOM's collapse, is that our, our solutions for energy might really lie in renewables going forward and some of these conversations that we have to generate. And perhaps out of, out, out of these new spaces, there can be innovation and we can start looking at things like a green economy and also a more a, a democratic ownership of power generation. Because if I'm creating my own power off the roof of my house, that means that I have more control, more access, um, and, and there's more democratized um, distribution of power generation in society. And the big thing really in Africa that is a hindrance towards economic growth is this idea of energy in itself, because half of Africa is dark. And so if we can start looking, but we also have a lot of sun to which we can begin to use. So these spaces of innovation that we can think about. Um, and I think climate change must become a conversation. And I really, I stayed away with it from it from a very long time. And I think it's time that activists also engage with this question in a more real way.
I mean, it's a development issue. Leonard, I'm going to um, give you the last word. I mean, there was a very interesting question for you. Um, what are the cognitive effects of the historical wound? But unfortunately, we don't really have time to, to go into that. But just sort of um, 30 seconds as the last, um, the last word on this. Um, yeah, um, I want to go back to a comment that Paul Hoffman made earlier. Um, in response to my question to you, are we a liberal democracy or a social mm. democracy? He said, well, in fact, well, are effectively social democracy. My point is, again, similar to the one I started out with, much can shift if we shift the way and we think, the way in which we think about ourselves. And I think one of the important shifts we need to make is to stop thinking that we're a liberal democracy. We're not. You know, um, we are ineffectively, I think, de facto a social democracy. And, you know, but that will be a huge debate because then you have to position that in terms of its socialist outcome and whatnot. Yeah, it's higher but, order. Yeah. But, but at least, and this is all I want to, to say um, by way of conclusion, at least the philosophical justification for starting that ideological debate would be to say that a social democracy would be much more in tune, there would be less, much less of a jarring tension between the values embedded in a liberal democratic constitution and the actual communitarian values that people subscribe to. Okay? Mm. Well, That's the uh, thing. Yeah. We, have, yes. we have a regime of, of law that has nothing to do with the values that the majority mm. of South Africans subscribe to, and we need to close that gap. And to start rethinking what exactly is the nature of our political system, I think could be one way to just, mm, I don't know, get us closer to closing that gap. Hmm. Well, uh, we've run out of time. We're one minute over. And I'd just like to thank um, Musa Kobani, Leonard Prague, and Michael Yordan. Thank you so much um, for joining our panel discussion um, this afternoon. I think what we've heard is that South Africa um, has a lot of work ahead of it, particularly around issues of education, around issues of growth, um, but also as Musa's last point about questions of climate change, innovation, broadband, all of these things that we can do, but somehow we, we're, being, we're styming ourselves off and shooting ourselves in the foot. And hopefully this has been a stimulating conversation ahead of the annual Nelson Mandela lecture on July the 18th. So before we all sign off, I'd just like to thank the panel and thank Hans Seidel Foundation, who are the donors, and also to Lee Davies and Sylvia Graham of the Nelson Mandela Foundation for setting all of this up so efficiently. And um, people are able to, you are able to um, register for the annual lecture on the Nelson Mandela Foundation uh, website. So thank you very much to everyone who joined us, and we hope to see you virtually at the lecture. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you, everyone. Great. Thanks.